All right, how's everybody doing? Oh, okay, good. I wasn't sure. It was after eating lunch. Some people get a little tired after eating lunch. Uh, I wanted to thank you very much, Howard, for having us and uh, having me here to talk a little bit about this year, um, giving you a little update on, on what we've been working on in the Appropriations Committee, um, what this year has been like, uh, and what we're going to be dealing with this next session, at least what I, what I believe we're going to be dealing with, which uh, may, may impact the work that you do. Um, and I want to leave it up for questions because I am really curious. Uh, the, you know, the individuals in this room come from many different walks of life, and, and I have a stake in this. Uh, but I'm curious about what questions you have on the work that we're doing in the legislature. Feedback, pushback, uh, it's, it's what we need right now. We need more stakeholder engagement and not less. Um, just a little bit more about me. I, I started off my career as a teacher. Uh, I was a public school teacher in New York City. I, um, I am born and raised in New York. My parents are from Peru and moved to the States when they were about 19. Uh, I, I loved education uh, so much. But what I really loved about it, it was the actual, the being in the community piece and, and changing and working within a system. Uh, that's how I got into policy, actually. And uh, my wife was also a teacher. We both started working in the nonprofit sector, working with uh, high urban city centers, uh, working in, with community organizations to try to improve the outcomes for kids and also improve the life of uh, of families. And uh, what I realized is a lot of this lived outside of what also happens within the classroom also lives outside of what's happening in people's families, in their homes, in their daily lives. And we're talking about working families. Um, so I've continued to do this work. Um, I was very fortunate enough. I came to Nebraska uh, as a result of my wife. Uh, she is a public defender, works in the juvenile justice system, uh, cares very deeply about the same issues having to do with behavioral health um, because they impact a lot of the families and the work that she does. Um, so she came here for Creighton Law School, and we moved here um, about five and a half, six years ago, and have been very, very fortunate ever since to uh, be members of uh, the South Omaha and downtown community, which is the district that I represent. Um, I represent a district that uh, is very uh, unique. It's one of the, my, my, when I ran in my campaign and now in the Nebraska legislature, I try not to lose sight of uh, because of the healthcare needs that, that exist in my district. I have one of the second highest populations of individuals that, will, or that are eligible for Medicaid, uh, have a large percentage of, of, of individuals that are uh, eligible for CHIP, uh, and a large number of students uh, that are on the free and reduced lunch program. Uh, and so when you look at the, just the, the, my district in a whole, we just see a lot of really high needs communities and families uh, that are being affected by our public system and are either being helped or hurt by things and changes that we make uh, in the legislature. And so I, I'm just very proud to represent that community. And it's the reason why I, I, I ran for the legislature is because it's a very unique community that does not get a lot of, uh, a lot of love and a lot of uh, perspective always in the legislature. Uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how this year has been, um, the process that we take within the Appropriations Committee, what we do, because I think it's something that most people don't have a really strong uh, connection to. And as individuals that are on the ground doing this work as policymakers, I, I also like to educate individuals on how they can be better advocates for things that are happening within their, their circles of work. Uh, so I am a member of the Appropriations Committee. This is obviously our budget making committee. And uh, this year has been a very, very difficult year um, for many different instances. Uh, we are challenged with every single biennium with determining how we're going to appropriately budget uh, funding for the entire state of Nebraska, every agency and department and program, many of which obviously affect the work that you do um, and affect workforce readiness and development, and affect behavioral health initiatives and aid. Um, but we, we, this affects everything that we do. Uh, and so every single year, um, we are obviously doing our due diligence, but every, every other year in these, in these uh, odd number of years, uh, we are doing our biennium budget. Uh, and so our nine member committee that it's d pretty much split evenly in terms of uh, demographics across the states, uh, what we're charged with is uh, looking at every single agency um, looking at the revenue that's coming in and figuring out how are we best going to appropriate funds um, given both growth and need and, and, and do it in a way that is as equitable as possible. Um, I'm going to tell you this year was particularly difficult um, for a couple of different reasons, things that I think are going to continue to impact 
uh, health care can impact mental and behavioral health care in the state. Um, the first is when we're looking at the Appropriations Committee process, um, we're always looking at trends in terms of ongoing revenue that are coming in through the state of Nebraska. We rely very heavily on, I think, three major pieces of revenue uh, that, that help uh, make sure that we are, we're, we're growing. Um, and the biggest one has to do with property taxes. Um, sales tax is the other one. Um, but our biggest one, property taxes, you know, what we're having right now is a very difficult downturn in our state economy relative to the rest of the Midwest. I'll say we're still very healthy in a lot of places, but in terms of the revenue that we're seeing coming out of what we're expecting, um, we are forecasting pretty low. Um, the reason why I say this and why this is important is because uh, we base much of our budgeting every two years in our biennium based off of our revenue forecasts. So for example, right now, as agriculture is doing very poorly, uh, it is affecting the revenue receipts that we're getting in every single month. Uh, the reason why this is so hard is because we don't often do very long-term planning in the Appropriations Committee in the way that we'd like to. We live in these two-year cycles, and we rely very heavily on our forecasting of revenue receipts to then determine how much more we can grow state government, how much more we can grow aid to programs, um, how much we can grow systems like, let's say, UNMC uh, to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our community um, and where we're going to get the funding for that. Unlike the federal government, we do rely and we have to have a balanced budget at the end of every biennium, which means we have to operate with what we, we have to be very conservative to what we think is coming in and what, what, what we currently have on hand. And so we do rely on this, on this revenue projections to help us understand where we're going. And so coming into this year, revenue projections uh, heading into December before last year were, were trailing. Uh, every single, basically from June 2016 until December 2016, we were seeing every single month of our sort of revenue, projected revenue growth was, was trailing behind where we expected it to be. Uh, what that meant for us was coming into my first day in session, my first year in the legislature, uh, we entered, uh, which is pretty unprecedented uh, an area. Um, usually, in instances where we have uh, this revenue shortfall, we will do uh, a special session can be called by the governor in collaboration with the legislature. A special session is usually dealt with trying to figure out a way to fill in the gaps of our revenue and then prioritizing where we're going to make potential cuts to state government. Unfortunately, this year, that's what we did. We didn't have a special session, but in many ways, it felt like it. The first two days of the session, uh, we pow out of the Appropriations Committee and decided that we needed to cut, uh, and we were projecting to try to cut somewhere between 100 to $200 million to be able to deal with our shortfall. And so immediately within the first uh, couple of weeks, we engaged in a short budget uh, review cycle. Uh, and the reason why this is important, just to give you a little bit of uh, clarity into what we've been doing in the Appropriations Committee, uh, we try to make sure government and our budget process is as transparent as possible. So what we do is uh, we, we do our first due diligence looking at every single agency and accumulated growth, utilization of funds in every single agency, and then we have an open hearing process. So even though this is a shortened process, we invited all of our agencies and also had an open dialogue with any, any, anybody that's in the field that has a stake in a specific budget or program to come and testify in support of a program or agency to either keep it the same, maintain it, uh, in this instance, uh, give us recommendations for where we can find some cost-cutting initiatives within our state government process. It was not a fun process, and again, we have not had this happen in the last 10 years to this extent, uh, and this has actually been one of the hardest in the last 20 years, um, sort of internal recessions other than 2010 to 11, not recessions, but downturns in our, in our current state government. Uh, and so it was a difficult process. We ended up cutting uh, about $137 million uh, plus looking into every single agency, and we did this uh, looking at what we budgeted in the previous biennium, uh, and, and that was not a very easy process. So I just want to say that. Um, what we did do is we asked every agency to, to figure out and prioritize what is best going to meet the needs of every single agency and program so that we can do, um, we're not harming growth 
uh, and then also setting us up for a little bit more success when we're actually engaging in the full budget process. Uh, so we did that within the matter of about three to five weeks. Uh, we're fortunate enough that uh, it, it was a pretty collaborative process with every agency's uh, and we moved into our actual budget process. So our actual biennium budget, we're budgeting for the two-year cycle, and we did this uh, for the rest of the remainder of the year. Um, the difficulties here is we continue to look at receipts uh, every couple of months that come from our forecasting board, uh, and the forecasting board continued to came back with, with results that were trailing. Again, we have not seen uh, in, in, our recent, in the recent decade uh, trailing receipts like this in a very, very long time. Um, which meant um, one of two things. We either find ways to raise revenue um, in our highest need areas, or we continue to review our budget process and find places to cut. Um, the Appropriations Committee is a separate committee from the Revenue Committee. Um, however, they, we do have conversations with them about what we need, what we're doing. We can't balance a checkbook without knowing um, if there's gonna be some additional income coming in, just like any household. Um, um, unfortunately, it is also very difficult because uh, we are individual senators, we have individual needs and politics and uh, districts and uh, initiatives do play a role. So I would say in this session, um, while we were having and while we we're still having uh, a downturn in our revenue receipts, we also have uh, big issues that came up in the legislature that caused it, made it very difficult to develop, um, have a conversation about what is a responsible way to increase revenue to meet the ever-growing needs of our, our highest population of poverty that are growing, our increasing needs for, for CHIP, for, Medi for Medicaid, for behavioral health, for, for all mental health needs, for growing our public universities, for community college, for public education. Um, and uh, many things rose to the top in this legislative session that made that difficult. One of the main things uh, had to do with property taxes. Um, now, regardless of where your stances are on property taxes, it does make it very, very difficult when we're talking about um, providing property tax relief while also thinking about cutting services. Uh, it, that balance is very, very difficult. And so in, in this session, we had to work very tirelessly to uh, look at uh, what money is currently coming in and if we're not able to actually increase revenue, uh, what are we going to do within the state budget process? Um, the governor did re make recommendations across the board for every different agency. Uh, and in some instances, the, we agreed with the governor's recommendation. In some instances, we disagreed. Uh, in terms of where we disagreed, uh, I, which I think are the most helpful, where we disagreed, we had different opinions, had a lot to do actually with uh, the health care, uh, health and human services, and uh, the health care area. Uh, we tended to disagree with um, provider rates, how much we should be increasing provider rates for um, all different, different areas within health and human services. Uh, we disagreed with public education funding. Um, we disagreed with higher education funding. Um, and we, th those are probably some of the biggest that had a, the largest, we disagreed with some aspect with child welfare, with developmental disabilities. Um, and a lot of this had to do with this notion of utilization. So every single year as we're looking and we're having open agency hearings and we are having people testify and we're doing our due diligence, we were also looking at the numbers of our utilization uh, and continued reoccurring uh, money that was being carried over from the next buy-in and from the previous buy-in. And we were seeing that um, in regards to, let's say, for the Medicaid population, uh, we should continue to have underutilization, even though we have a high population of Medicaid in different parts of Nebraska and it's a growing need, we were seeing a, a low util lower utilization rate um, at this time. Uh, and so, which led uh, a lot of our agencies uh, to, to begin to say, well, there's more that we can cut and we probably should cut. And it's, it's I think, is an, a, a good way of looking at it. Um, but the conversation really had is there's a difference between the utilization and preparing for the population that we know we have. Uh, at any given point, we can have a large influx of individuals that are utilizing these funds. Um, and if we were not to have them, we would be in very dire straits. We wouldn't be able to very quickly uh, and, and very easily require the funds to be able to fund these different programs. Um, and so in terms of our budget process, we engaged in this conversation. We had multiple uh, 
cycles of this. So we started off obviously with looking, doing our forecasting, looking at every utilization, having open agency hearings, and then coming back to the drawing table and prioritizing what was best given the needs of Nebraska. Um, the budget we put out um, that we eventually introduced to the, the floor uh, was a little, I think, unorthodox given what we've seen from past budget cycles. And part of the reason is every single year we have to put out a balanced budget, but we also need to make sure that we are finding some more creative ways to balance that budget if we don't have enough funds coming in. So what we did is we took about uh, $100 million uh, from some cash fund transfers. Um, cash fund uh, arenas are, are smaller pockets uh, uh, of, of funds that are, uh, are dedicated to something um, and we have the ability to be able to transfer those over in times like this to be able to balance our budget. We also transferred about $173 million from our cash reserve fund. Our cash reserve is meant to be there um, to provide some security. Uh, it's our basically piggy bank to make sure rainy day fund to some extent that make sure we are, uh, we have something to rely on. Um, and so we did dip into that. And we did make sure that we're also keeping our so statutory requirements and our reserve uh, which we have to have it at a certain amount. Uh, and so we, we were able to do this, put it forward. Um, the good thing is that on the, on the floor of the legislature, we were able to find uh, agreement on most of our budget. Um, where we didn't, uh, the governor did introduce several uh, line item vetoes on some very big areas. The ones that I think mattered uh, the most, especially to this group, do have to do with provider rates. Uh, they have to do with child welfare developmental disabilities, some extent this uh, juvenile justice. Um, and, and what we saw with these was not uh, a blatant disagreement on whether or not we should prioritize these areas or not, but we do need to figure out a way to find the funds to make up for, uh, for what he was proposing to, uh, to veto. Um, ultimately, the legislature, we could not uh, override that, those vetoes. Um, but we were able to put, our, put through a balanced budget uh, to the legislature and put it forward. Um, so that's the good silver lining here. Uh, the unfortunate uh, side of all this is our work is not done. So you may or may not have heard this. Uh, we, we have had the forecasting board come back and make some new recommendations based off of new information that's come through. Uh, and what this means for us, we're seeing receipts uh, averaging over the next, uh, this year and next year, being short about $200 million. And so what this means for our, for the Appropriations Committee and for the legislature at large, especially in these non biennium budget planning years, is where are we going to be able to figure out and find the resources to then balance this budget um, and not wait until the next biennium um, for, for that cycle to make it more difficult on ourselves. Um, and so that's where we are right now. The Appropriations Committee uh, will be coming back together this next session and we'll be trying to figure out and having conversations with the governor's office and every single agency again to figure out, prioritize what can be done uh, and how much have we actually utilized over this last, since we, we, we did signy die for the last six months. Um, what do our receipts look like? What does utilization look like with every agency? And we're gonna have this conversation again in, in, in January. Um, which at that point, uh, I, my hope is that we engage every single agency, department, stakeholders like yourselves to figure out um, in what role uh, do, do you need to play in informing us of these issues um, so that we can continue to grow Nebraska in the way that we need. Um, from my opinion, uh, I'll be very frank, I believe that we, we need to continue to prepare for worst case scenario, which is that um, if revenue is not continuing to increase, and our revenue committee uh, is not seeking solutions that may necessarily increase revenue in, in some creative ways for the state of Nebraska, um, there's gonna need to be a conversation about um, what do we do long-term beyond this next budget cycle to then be able to balance our budget and grow Nebraska. Um, and for those of you that are affiliated with UNMC uh, and the, the University of Nebraska system, this was also a very, very big conversation we had this last year around funding for the university uh, and going back and forth about how do we grow ourselves out of uh, a downturn like this. Um, I'm of the mind that we, uh, 
as much as we expect accountability for, for every single agency and we look at utilization, I also believe we need to figure out ways to grow our, re our career readiness and grow in the areas that we need and help our, our, our neediest areas across the state, which I do believe in, in, this, in this arena of uh, the legislature, we need to make sure we're looking at uh, what are the highest need areas across the state of Nebraska. And from my experience and what we've looked into, the highest need areas exist all over urban and rural Nebraska and there's healthcare needs that need to be met. Um, which means we have a workforce issue that we need to, we have career readiness issues that we need to, and I believe that continuing to grow these within the state of Nebraska, within our public university system and other private university systems is a priority or else we're not gonna have the individuals like yourself to be able to continue to do this work and we also won't be able to fund the work that you do. Um, that's my opinion uh, and it's opinion that I share in the appropriations committee uh, every single day. Uh, I can keep talking for a very long time about this process, but I did want to open it. Trust me, I can keep talking. Um, but I wanted to open it up for questions, knowing um, a lot of the issues that you face and the different you know, roles you play uh, and knowing the work that I do. And I'm one of 49, so I wanted to open it up. Oh, perfect. We have five minutes? Oh, geez. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tina Vess. I'm in uh, private practice, nurse practitioner in Lincoln. I really appreciate what you said, Senator Vargas. What really hit home to me, you talked about utilization being a litmus test, so to speak. One concern I have about that is, especially with the Medicaid population, mm -hmm. um, I think utilization is probably being underutilized because of lack of access to providers. There's quite a wait list even in my clinic for either commercial or Medicaid or Medicare. And is that data really accurate as far as assessing the need? And how do we communicate that to appropriations, senators, et cetera? You just did, which is really good. Um, <laughs> but numerically, so it affects the budgets accordingly. No, it, it does. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious too. How, how many people agree with that? Okay, good, okay, yeah. You can snap too, sometimes that helps. It's very non-invasive. Non um, I think you are right. It's, it's actually the, the, uh, it's the discussion, the dialogue we had in regards to provider rates. Obviously, uh, there, there is an interdependence between utilization and provider rates and accessibility and funding that making sure we're keeping that accessible uh, still plays a role. Uh, I, I believe that, and, and, and I'm not sure how many of you get to advocate, and well, raise your hand, how many of you have actually talked to your senator? Well, no, wait, raise your hand if you know who your state senator is. All right, put your hand down. All of your hands need to be raised next time I ask that question in a year if I come back to this. Um, uh, it is very important. I, I will tell you, um, the margins are very, very close here, not just in the Appropriations Committee, but in the legislature. Um, I think sometimes, uh, the data is going to help, but uh, and 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 shedding more light on this will help making that connection. But it's going to be more helpful when more individuals in this room are contacting their state senators as somebody that's doing the on the ground work, in addition to uh, larger associations and agencies that are representing your interests. And because I don't believe that we hear enough individually from people. Um, I mean, I, I talk with certain on certain bills, and even even this in particular. Uh, I remember having conversations with some senators that says, well, I haven't really heard from many people in the healthcare community, individual citizens in my district that play a role in this. They've heard from associations, they've heard from you know, uh, private agencies and, and, and coalitions, but they haven't heard from the people themselves that live in those areas. Um, so I think in addition to what you just said, which is really helpful, contacting your state senators and having this conversation about what your life really looks like, um, being proactive is gonna be one of the best solutions, I think, moving forward. Hi, Senator Vargas. Renee Claiborne, I'm gonna speak as a private citizen uh, with good. this next question. Um, I re I, you are not my senator, but okay. I do represent schools that are in your district. Um, I think I'm really excited about the expansion of Medicaid in public schools with behavioral health services being one of those that we are going um, to uh, be seeing this year. I do have a concern um, and 
not from an appropriations uh, committee concern, but maybe to all senators, is how are districts going to be able to expand those services? And then uh, secondly, how does the TIOSA funding model create some inequities that districts are going to be able to afford to provide these additional services? So just something for the, the body to think about this year yeah. and uh, looking at data and seeing how that um, is going to affect that model. How we expand those services, I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, talking right over with our partners about what they need to expand those services that exist in addition, obviously, to funding, there's gonna be a conversation. Uh, raise your hand, how many people are really familiar with TIOSA? Oh, <laughs> that's good. Um, not that you need to be too familiar with it, but I think it's really helpful knowledge for everybody to understand that our TIOSA formula is essentially our formula that we use to fund our, our education system, our public education system across the state of Nebraska. And uh, this is what is uh, a very, very contentious uh, a formula that uh, isn't always providing a level of equity across the state of Nebraska. Um, so what a big conversation is gonna be uh, is uh, for this year, we actually did fund public education um, at, uh, at a, what I think is a reasonable rate, uh, not, not what they actually expected, but one of our, lar our largest line item budget, um, top two is within education. <laughs> Uh, if we don't look at ways to change TIOSA in the future, um, we are going to continue to see some of the inequities across the state of Nebraska in regards to the money that's going to different districts, urban and rural. Um, I know that's a conversation that's being had between the Education and Appropriations Committee. Uh, it's something we're going to continue to have. And every single year, there's somebody that brings some. This last year, there was at least three different bills that had to do with changing or, or um, setting different goals for TIOSA formula. Um, but for the purposes of you, it does have an impact on our overall final budget and, and what we provide in terms of equity across the state of Nebraska for schools and, and funding that they receive. And it's very heavily reliant on property taxes, which is why property taxes is such an issue in the legislature that affects every single uh, agency and specifically the work that you do. It, it's the hardest thing that we're, we're trying to crack that, uh, solve that case right now. Oh, we're done? Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Oh, okay, you have a question. Okay. question. Um, maybe it lives outside of recommendations for how you can engage me, um, but I do need help. You know, I, I recognize that there are workforce shortages. You know, we, you and I have had this conversation about the need for uh, more uh, trained behavioral health uh, individuals across the state of Nebraska in our highest need areas. We are fortunate to have some public-private partnerships that are providing career pathways for this. Uh, and so I have questions in my head, and I would love answers. Questions really have to do with um, what are some of the barriers that are, uh, what are the barriers in terms of being able to have a livable wage in the work that you do? What are the barriers procedurally in terms of, um, you know, payment for services? What are barriers in terms of providing, uh, making sure people can get um, some incentive for, for working in places where we have higher needs? Um, and uh, making sure that certifications or anything that we require through the department, uh, we are looking at a regulation that may be impeding people's abilities to then operate or work and survive and thrive in an area. Um, I have a lot of questions about what that is gonna look like in addition to adequate funding, um, because we're living in a place where 
we can be more creative outside of funding now if we need be. I know the Appropriations Committee had a hearing the other day um, about uh, specifically for um, a specific, uh, oh, Senator Stinner's bill, um, looking at PhD psychiatrists uh, to be uh, certified to be interns or externs in rural Nebraska, and that be actually being able to get uh, paid for that. Um, there was an issue with their um, temporary certification and where they were classified. Uh, and because of that classification, it's delayed their, their, their ability to get paid and, and have a salary. And because of that delay, it's just a disincentive to then have individuals in one of our highest need areas across Nebraska. And one of the questions I ask is, well, what if we changed um, basically the requirement or changed some of the language? And that actually would, would save some, some small change uh, in, in procedure in statute would actually change the ability for somebody to, to be incentivized to work in that area um, with that specific certification. Um, so that's the questions I have, and, and, and I would love answers to that because, like I said, I'm, I think none of us are in the legislature are experts, um, but we are here to figure out and, and be as informed as possible. Um, so. You might have to speak loudly. <laughs> I can hear you just fine too, so I'll make sure to repeat. My name is Gabby Phillips. Mm -hmm. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner and a clinical nurse specialist from Hastings. So Senator Cowan from the 6th District represents me. Um, I'm also a member of the Nebraska Nurse Practitioners Legislative Committee. We are fortunate um, as a result of uh, the Nebraska legislature passing full practice authority for nurse practitioners Nebraska. Uh, nurse practitioners are one of a group of four advanced practice nurses. Which would include certified registered nurse anesthetists, clinical nurse specialists, nurse practitioners, and certified nurse midwives. Understanding um, Governor Ricketts's uh, request to deregulate and make Nebraska a more workforce friendly state across state lines, a possible revenue neutral solution that our group is forming a coalition with other advanced practice nurse groups and the Nebraska Nurses Association to look at compact legislation for advanced practice nurses as we have for registered nurses so that uh, licensed professionals can move more fluidly across state lines to address workforce issues. I am so glad that you brought that up. Um, and I would love to talk after this about this. We've had, so, so the debate that we currently have, and this doesn't just exist in, in terms of, um, let's say, certification or ability to practice for nurse practitioners. Um, or in, in, in any field that you're in. It, this extends beyond any field that we're seeing. This extends to, um, let's say even teachers. We, we've had conversations about, um, we, you know, for example, in education, we actually do have shortages in certain areas in the same way that we have shortages in, in the healthcare uh, field. Um, and what we don't want to happen is that as a result of changes in certification laws, that we, we would somehow uh, lower the bar uh, for, uh, care that we expect in Nebraska. And sometimes we are above that in, uh, uh, when you look at the entire Midwest, and I think we're proud of that. But there's also instances of things that will not allow uh, sort of uh, reciprocity from state to state or uh, make sure we're, we're, we're being a, a better climate for individuals to come here and fill the needs that we currently can't, we, we can't fill um, within our current workforce. Um, so I would love to talk more about that. That's, I, especially since it's revenue neutral. <laughs> Senator Vargas, I think we do have to wrap up this part, oh, we do. but uh, okay. please help me thank Senator Vargas for such great insights. <clears throat> and I think it's clear that even though it sounds like we've got some challenges ahead that we really need to partner together, and we thank you for being such a great advocate for that.
And please, please, again, I, I, I've been saying this to a lot of different groups. If you haven't contacted your state senator to have a sit down with them, and if you really care about some of these issues based on what I've told you about the current climate, um, advocacy really does work. And um, what I don't want the message to be is that we are, um, we're having a downturn, but even in that downturn, we still grew state, we grew our budget by about, you know, one little less than 1%. Um, and funding, we're still prioritizing it. So I do believe that uh, with the voices in this room, um, there is a place for us to continue to advocate for the right funding in the right areas that we need. Um, but if we don't speak up, it's a lot harder to make that case out of the committee and to even get something out of the committee onto the floor. So please contact your state senators, contact me. I'm happy to be uh, a liaison to any of them. I know them all and um, I just appreciate all the work that you do and come and talk to me afterwards if you have any questions. Thank you.